The following is part of a national PBS series called Sinking Cities, produced in conjunction with Peril and Promise, a WNET New York initiative telling stories of climate change around the world. I'm here with Bren Haas, Executive Director of the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority of Louisiana. Bren, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. So I want to talk about basically how the state makes decisions for coastal projects, essentially. The state, of course, has lost something like 2,000 square miles of land, coastal marsh, since the 30s, roughly, about the size of the state of Delaware. Um, the state, of course, has had a plan to deal with that going back to 2007 um, with its first coastal master plan. Um, and so that plan, which has been updated a couple of times since, includes all kinds of projects like levees or marshes, um, a number of different things. But I'm wondering how, the, how does the state decide what to put where? Like how do you decide to put a levee over here or a marsh over there or um, a barrier island over here? How do you even start to make that calculation? It, it really starts with uh, the universe of projects, honestly, and, and um, which projects um, are proposed. So as we're, getting, as we're um, developing the state's master plan, uh, we put a public call out for, for projects. And so um, people have obviously very different ideas. Maybe they want to levy here or march there. Uh, they present that to us and then uh, that goes into the mix in terms of sort of what those universal projects are. We then go through a, a pretty rigorous evaluation process of each of those projects. Um, and it really comes down to two basic things. How well uh, will a risk reduction project reduce risk uh, in terms of storm surge flooding? for our coast and how well uh, would a marsh creation project or sort of an ecosystem restoration type project uh, result in, in more land uh, for the coast of Louisiana over, over the future. Right next door there's a, a big new building called the Center for River Studies. Um, it's got a huge model of the lower Mississippi River, the size of two basketball courts. It was really expensive, more than 10 million dollars I believe. What is that going to be used for? Is that going to be helping make decisions about where to put things, um, projects? What is what is the point of that sure. model over there? Yeah, absolutely. Well, so the, the uh, it's a partnership between LSU and the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority. It's LSU Center for, for River Studies that, uh, again, we're partnering with LSU on. There's really two main uh, purposes uh, for that building. One, uh, it's a great outreach and education tool about the issues facing coastal Louisiana. So there's some exhibit space there, and of course we can um, um, project some visuals onto the model actually with projectors and, and uh, you know show, show some pretty neat stuff and tell the story of coastal Louisiana. But two, it's also a technical tool for evaluating projects. Hopefully most folks are aware that all of southeast Louisiana was created by the river essentially and it's changing courses, it's sediment, it's freshwater, and it's nutrients building up deltaic Louisiana. Um, and so one of the tenets of our master plan is to reconnect the river without that deltaic plain to help preserve some of the marshland that we still have and also to help restore uh, and recreate some new land as well. And so what that uh, model over there is, is it's a small scale, uh, scaled down version of the lower Mississippi River essentially from Donaldsonville all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. And um, in that river, uh, we can control water levels, flow, uh, and mimic the actual flow in the real river. Um, and, and probably most importantly, there's some simulated um, sediment particles that we can in inject essentially into the model or into the river um, and see how the, that sediment reacts to things like a potential diversion project, uh, different dredging schemes in the river, if a pass might be opened or closed and that kind of a thing. So it can, it can give us another tool. It's another tool that we can use to understand how managing the river in certain ways can help preserve the coast um, and help rebuild our coastal wetlands. So I know that model's been up and running for about a year. Um, so have you learned anything so far? Have any particular tests you've run and lessons yeah. you've learned? We have. In fact, um, um, Dr. Clint Wilson, who, who runs that uh, with LSU, uh, we were speaking yesterday and we actually have run the, the first calibration run, or future without action run, uh, on that model um, to see, um, it's a 50-year run, to see uh, what the river and its surrounding landscape might look like in 50 years without any of the uh, projects on the ground that, that we're contemplating right now. That's the first step. Next step, obviously, is to start introducing those projects, some of the diversion projects and so forth, and, and see, how, um, see how the model reacts to that, and then compare the two so you know what, essentially what you get. So why do we need a fiscal model anyways? Because I know the master plan is full of all these maps and pictures of what the, what the landscape will look like. So we're capable, clearly, of modeling and 
visually projecting what the landscape might look like without a physical model. So why do we have to build that thing? It's another way of confirming um, uh, what we see in nature uh, and what we see uh, coming out of those computer models. Um, so um, it's always good to have um, you know, two answers to the same question, um, or, or redundant answers, I should say, um, to, the, to the same question. That's really kind of the theory here. So um, we do have very sophisticated computer models that help us predict what the future may look like with projects on the ground or without them on the ground. The physical model is just another way of, um, uh, of evaluating those things. Um, and if the two match up, then we have a higher degree of certainty that, uh, or higher degree of confidence that, uh, that our evaluations are, are correct. So you still need both. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Okay. The state's master plan, of course, is not just about building things. Um, it's also about adapting and getting out of harm's way in some cases. So there's a whole category of projects called non-structural projects, non-structural programs. And these are things like um, programs that would help people um, weatherize their homes or businesses or um, flood proof them, raise them up um, on stilts. Um, or even in some cases like buyout programs. The state is just now starting to do a study to figure out which homes in South Louisiana might be might qualify for like buyouts or, or elevations. Mm -hmm. So is this a, a type of project that we might start seeing more of, these non-structural projects? Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, we have recently just signed an agreement with the Corps of Engineers in the southwestern part of the state. Um, which is really the, the first, uh, our first sort of dipping our toe in the water of, of um, getting into this, the non-structural game. Um, so they're uh, doing some reconnaissance work there essentially to identify which structures um, uh, are at risk and what the solutions may be there. And so we're excited about that. Mm -hmm. And so would that mean that the state would provide money for, for doing things like raising homes or yes. voluntary buyouts so the state would pay people to do those things? Yes. Yeah, we will. We would. We are looking to provide funding to be able to accomplish those. There's, uh, you know, a number of situations across the coast. This is something that we're we're kind of keying in on right now as well, where uh, perhaps the federal government has funding available, and it may be sitting in the bank in some of these parishes, for example, for projects where a home might be able to be elevated, but either the parish can't afford to match the federal dollars, uh, or the homeowner, individual business owner, whoever it may be, may not be able to match the um, the federal dollars, and so with um, uh, a relatively small expenditure on the state side, you can receive a tremendous amount of benefit and unlock a lot of a lot of dollars uh, to do some good for the communities along the coast. And so that's uh, kind of a low-hanging fruit situation, and that's something that we're keying in on right now. Mm -hmm. And so, why haven't we seen um, these types of non-structural programs um, until now? You know, the the master plan. We're more than ten years into uh, these master plans um, mm -hmm. from CPRA. So far, it seems like there's been a lot of focus on the physical projects. Mm -hmm. And so is this, why, why, why now? Why is it now that we're starting to, that you're starting to see um, or explore non-structural programs? And, and, and then also, where's that money going to come from? Well, the second question is a very, very good one. Uh, we don't know where all that money is going to come from. Uh, what we've identified in the master plan uh, is a non-structural program that would cost, if implemented, about $6 billion. Uh, that's a tremendous, that's a big number. <laughs> Uh, and the state doesn't have all of that. The federal government doesn't have all of that. Obviously, our citizens don't have, uh, don't have all of that. So, um, but what we found is, is having a good plan in place has positioned us well for when funding does become available. Uh, the first part of your question related to sort of why now, I think, um, you know, quite frankly, when folks settled coastal Louisiana, um, the, the standard practice was non-structural, right? If you think about old Acadian homes and so forth, they were all elevated. Um, uh, folks knew that this area flooded and the floods could come and they wouldn't uh, affect their homes and the floods would subside and, and you know, for folks could get back to, to business as usual. I think, um, you know, between then and now, sort of, we've been in, a, in much more of a, we need levees, we need flood walls, we have everything, every solution needs to be an engineered structured um, solution. And uh, obviously we've, we've seen the um, vulnerabilities of some of those uh, kinds of solutions with Hurricanes Katrina and Rita uh, and many, many storms since then. So I think there's just a growing realization that um, we can't put a levee around every home, we can't put a flood wall around every home, and that we need to look at, at other alternatives and find a better way to live with water rather than trying to continuously fight that water. Mm -hmm. 
Looking at the master plan, are, are there any specific projects or maybe just approaches to the plan that are um, in response to climate change or that are meant to address climate change in particular? I don't think there's any one project in particular that is designed to deal with sort of climate change issues in coastal Louisiana. I think the whole suite of projects and the whole plan really is an adaptation plan for a changing coast. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of that change, of course, is going to be the result of, of climate change. And does the does the CPRA take any positions on um, like encouraging the state to reduce emissions or anything like that to, to kind of do its part if we know that emissions um, are a big part of um, climate change? Um, does, the, does the master plan speak to that? We look at um, uh, various potential futures uh, as it relates to climate change and so uh, there are different scenarios and the plan is developed against a range of scenarios and those uh, scenarios include things like um, how much sea level might rise, um, number and intensity of hurricanes, uh, amount of precipitation and, and those kind of things. Um, we don't get into cause causation uh, specifically but we do uh, want to make sure we're well prepared for whatever the future may hold. Major funding for Sinking Cities, Peril and Promise was provided by Dr. P. Roy Vagelos and Diana T. Vagelos with additional funding from Sue and Edgar Wackenheim III and the Mark Haas Foundation. Additional funding for Peril and Promise is provided by Lise Strickler and Mark Gologli. Sinking Cities was also supported by the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations and viewers like you.